Hey there, Pickens chemistry students. So what I have for you here is a timeline of atomic discoveries. and models. Most of these will be models, but there will be a few other little discoveries that contribute to our understanding of the atom in here along the way. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna tell you about who the main observer was for each of these um, discoveries, what their observations were, if there is any particular type of model that we can sketch for their discovery or model and what the characteristics are of that model, if there's a model. And um, so we could put down here, we could say maybe say Aristotle um, as the first one. He's not actually on my personal timeline and uh, the joke we made the other day in, in school was that, you know, Aristotle's four elements of earth, um, earth, fire, air, and water. And the joke was, man, are we talking about the avatar cycle or something like that? But um, his idea was that there were four elements and that you could combine those four elements in any way to create what you wanted to make for any kind of matter. Um, and as philosophers did a lot of thinking, so Aristotle was also a philosopher, they looked at the world around them, but not like scientists do. Um, they looked at the world around them and they tried to come up with ideas for how things worked. And the main philosopher who kind of got us started with thinking about atoms was actually Democritus, who was alive from 460 to 370 BCE. And it's thought that he came up with these thoughts somewhere around BCE, before the Common Era. And so as I said, he was a philosopher. So he philosophized and really didn't have any observations, just kind of had his own thoughts. What he said was that Matter was made of identical individual or indivisible rather units. And the Greek word for indivisible is atomos. So this is where we get the word atom from. And his big thing here was that matter is discontinuous. Well, what does discontinuous mean? Continuous would mean that you've got something that you can always divide smaller and smaller and smaller. So you could have two people standing in a room one of those people could move halfway towards the other, the other one could move halfway again towards the other, and each time you took half, you would get closer and closer and closer and closer. And if you're always taking a half, the idea is that you never actually touch because there's always some amount of distance between you that you have to cut in half. That's continuous, as long as you can keep cutting things in half. But the idea with matter here, the idea of atoms, is that there is a point where matter becomes discontinuous or matter is discontinuous and you can't keep chopping it up into smaller and smaller pieces. So Democritus said that the smallest piece you could have for matter would be an atom and his model is really just of a kind of hard sphere um, like we typically maybe draw atoms as being. So just a ball floating in space. This is Democritus. After Democritus, kind of scientists didn't really necessarily think about atoms for a long time. Um, maybe they kind of thought about it this way, especially with say alchemy. So John Dalton, 
was really the next one to come along and to do any work on this. And Dalton was alive from 1766 to 1844. Common Era. And is credited with doing this work in the early, early 1800s. And what Dalton did, he did a bunch of stuff. He looked at the solubility of gases. Solubility of gases, so taking different gases and putting them into water or other types of solutions. And he looked at the combination of elements in different proportions. And from Dalton, we get the laws of definite and multiple proportions. The law of definite proportions says that whenever carbon and oxygen combine, they will always combine in a specific whole number ratio, one carbon to two oxygens or hydrogen, two hydrogens to one oxygen. And that those are specific compounds, carbon dioxide and water. And that whenever you're talking about those compounds, those compounds always have a definite proportion of elements in the compound. Because Dalton's theory was those elements were actually made up of atoms and that atoms were the smallest you could get. The law of multiple proportions says that you might have these elements combine in different proportions under different circumstances, under different conditions. And that just because carbon dioxide was always one carbon and two oxygens didn't mean that carbon and oxygen themselves could not combine in different ways. In fact, we have carbon monoxide. But carbon monoxide has very different properties than carbon dioxide. So this is the law of multiple proportions. We see the same thing with hydrogen and oxygen with say hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, which would have a ratio of one to one. And so both of these with water and hydrogen peroxide, carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, those are examples of the law of multiple propor proportions. And the idea that each of these specific compounds always has the same proportion between the elements is the law of definite proportions. So really all Dalton was doing was restating Democritus's model of a single hard sphere that was still indivisible. Indivisible, and he viewed them as solid spheres. The difference was that now Democritus had experimental evidence, or Dalton had experimental evidence where Democritus did not. Not specifically an atomic discovery, uh, atomic model rather, but more of a discovery. In the late 1800s, in 1896, so I'm gonna write this a little bit differently. I'm gonna do a date here. I'm not gonna give you the um, birth and death years for these people. But in 1896, Henri Becquerel, is credited with the discovery of radioactivity. And what he did or what he discovered, how he discovered this was he had uranium ores and salts on photographic plates. And he discovered that those photographic plates became exposed as though they had been exposed to visible light. They became exposed and when these plates were developed, they showed up with um, exposed areas near the ores or the salts that were on the plates. And if he had a rock that had a particular uranium mineral on one side of it, but not the other, the side of the rock with the uranium mineral was the side that was causing the plates to become exposed. 
So what Becquerel kind of discovered was that um, matter was not necessarily completely stable and that there was something coming out from the matter. Um, in other words, that atoms were divisible. He did not try to propose any type of a new model along with this, but he continued to work on this. The other people who worked on this besides Henri Becquerel were Marie Curie and her husband as well. And together, all three of them won the 1903 Nobel Prize in physics for their discovery and work on radioactivity. In fact, Marie Curie actually discovered several new elements. And she won a Nobel Prize in chemistry later for her discovery of new elements. So by 1896, maybe there's some understanding here that atoms are divisible and that the matter in atoms could actually be split. In 1897, J.J. Thompson who was alive from 1856 to 1940 in 1897 so just after the discovery of radioactivity he discovered that negative charge was contained within matter And he did this using something called a cathode ray tube. Now, if you've ever seen any old televisions or computer mon monitors with the big deep backs that are very, very um, deep and kind of big and boxy, not the nice like flat panels like we have now, those work on the same principle as a cathode ray tube where you put a electrical potential on both ends and that you can actually run electrical current through a gas contained in that. For televisions, you would steer that electron beam, but for a cathode ray tube, the idea was just that you were trying to see if you could break things down into negative charges. And so what Thomson said about the atom was that atoms were divisible units. Composed of negatively charged particles in a positively charged sphere. This is also where the term plum pudding comes from. You know, scientists sometimes are not the nicest people and Thompson's colleagues were trying to put down his model and basically um, call it a bunch of BS. And instead of calling it BS, they said that it was a bunch of plum pudding. And so his model is of a positive sphere with tiny little negative charges embedded within that positive sphere. And the negative charges could be pulled out of that sphere of the atom. Okay. So at this point, by the end of the 1800s, basically scientists have an understanding, a basic understanding that atoms are not indivisible, that they are made of smaller particles, in other words, subatomic particles, but that they were still investigating what those were. Now, as a part of the discovery of radioactivity, there were several particles discovered and their properties were um, investigated and we now know what those are. And even at the, around 1900, they had a good idea for what these were. 
So the very first type of radioactive particle discovered was called an alpha particle, and that's a bad alpha. Here's a better alpha. So an alpha particle. And relative to the other types of radioactivity, this was pretty heavy. This relatively had a mass number of four, and it relatively had an atomic number of two. And so what we understand now is that an alpha particle is really the nucleus of a helium four atom. So wherever it came from, somehow the atoms that emit alpha particles are losing two protons and two neutrons at the same time. And we would call that alpha decay, but there's gonna be a separate set of videos on radioactive re, uh, decays and nuclear reactions. Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet. The second letter is beta. And that is what the second particle discovered was called. And the beta particle was discovered to be very light and that it had a negative charge. And the particle that we know of commonly now that is light and has a negative charge is the electron. So this does not mean that an electron existed within the atom or within the nucleus specifically, but what this means is that an electron was created as some sort of a decay happened. The third particle discovered was much harder to discover because it is a type of electromagnetic radiation. The third letter in the Greek alphabet is the gamma. And so we actually now call these gamma rays because they are not necessarily particles at all. These have no mass and no charge. And so these are really a type of light, a photon of light. If you do wanna to try to think about them as a particle, or they are a type of what we call electromagnetic radiation. So again, this would be the end of the first part of this timeline. So from Democritus um, and before the Common Era up through about 1900, we have the concept that atoms make up matter that atoms were thought to be indivisible, but then the discoveries now have led to our understanding that atoms are made up of smaller particles themselves. So atoms are made of subatomic particles, but atoms are going to be the smallest unit that still show the properties of a particular element.